welcome. Thank you so much for coming to this exciting launch of uh, the exciting book that is Mistaken Identities uh, by the exciting scholar, activist, author. Oh, I thought you were like co-signing what I was saying. Uh, <laughs> is this okay? This. I'm Katie Halper. I'll just announce myself so that you don't miss the important stuff. I was just also testing the mic levels for when I may or may not be uh, imbibing something. Uh, it's a low low, okay. So, closer. Oh, I see. I, I got it. Okay, how's that? We are, it's, it's like a Mar um, Luddite, neo-Luddite, like some Hegelian Marxist something. Okay, no, you guys are already like, you didn't use that terminology correctly. Can you leave? This is a transphobia, but also free, but also like Marx usage, uh, misusage free zone. Is it, is it all good? I'm just trying to get out offensive material so while we're doing the sound check. No. Continue. Okay, you still can't hear me. And I have a loudish voice. Um, so, anyone from the Upper West Side here tonight? No. Okay. Can you guys move? Is, is this, is there any? Just can you guys not manspread? Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay, there I went there. Um, how is this now? Can everyone count to ten? Or like two? One, two. Can How you, everyone, can you hear us all? Levels? Is everyone, this is actually good One, wave. two, one, two. Yeah, okay. yeah. Like Great. This. So really, we are very excited. Everyone shut their cell phones off, please, or their volume at least. Again, my name is Katie Halper. I'm the host of the Katie Halper Show. And uh, I actually have had many of these uh, esteemed participants on my show. And uh, was very excited to be asked to moderate this discussion about Mistaken Identity, which is a really great book. You guys should all buy it, and maybe uh, the author will grace you with a signature. Um, Mistaken Identity, Race and Class in the Age of Trump. And so we're going to have a discussion. First, the author, Asad, um, will be reading an excerpt of the book. Then we will have some responses from the panelists, and then we'll open it up for, to the audience. So just want to give you guys a sense of who these wonderful speakers are. Um, we'll start with Assad. Assad Hader is a founding editor of Viewpoint Magazine, an investigative journal of contemporary politics. He's a PhD candidate in the history of consciousness at UC Santa Cruz and a member of UAW 2865, the Student Workers Union at the University of California. And in breaking news, he will be a postdoctoral fellow in philosophy at Penn State this fall. And as you know, you probably do know this, he's the author of Mistaken Identity, and it's gotten very, very good blurbs, by the way, which you should check out, uh, from Judith Butler, Bill Fletcher, Robin G. Kelly, Paul Gilroy, Wendy Brown. Okay, um, next, uh, to, my, to my right, physically, if not ideologically, uh, we have Brianna Joy Gray, who is a former, you're like a recovering attorney? Yeah, just as of last week. As so of last week. She's me. clean. She's been clean. She's been clean a week. Um, she was an attorney, and she is starting at, as a senior politics editor at The Intercept next week. So this is a historic moment. You guys can say you were there between those two important um, phases of her life. She's a contributing editor at Current Affairs magazine and has also written for New York Magazine, Rolling Stone, and The Guardian on the subject of, say it with me now, identity politics. Okay, that was a reference to this book. Okay, um, moving, moving along, uh, we uh, are also joined by Wendell Hassan Marsh, who is an assistant professor of African American and African Studies at Rutgers University, Newark. He holds a PhD in African Studies from Columbia University, and his work explores the historical encounter of Islam and the African world as mediated in African Arabic texts. He is interested in contemporary historical transformations in Northwestern Africa and the global politics of knowledge production, as well as the place of Islam and Africa in the making of the modern world. And he's a member of the editorial collective of Viewpoint Magazine. By the way, I meant to clap for everyone. And then Robin Morasco is associate professor of political science at Hunter College, CUNY. Her research focuses on critical theory, psychoanalysis, and feminist theory more specifically on the force of the passions in political life. Her first book, The Highway of Despair, Critical Theory After Hegel, was published by Columbia University Press in 2015, and she's currently working on a book on authority and the family. So, uh, everyone, welcome. 
and I'll, I'll, we have we have one more potential guest. We are not sure if he will make it. Um, and the reason he may not make it is because he is in traffic coming back from um, the NYU Prison Education Program that he is the director of. And I'm speaking of Nikhil Payne, sorry, Nikhil Pai Singh, who teaches uh, in the departments of social and cultural analysis and history at NYU. His most recent book is Race and America's Long War, which was put out by California UC Press. And he is the founding faculty director of the NYU Prison Education Program. And so that may keep him from arriving on time, slash at all, but he's here in spirit and uh, whatever, in material, dialectical material. Um, so I'm gonna pass the, uh, the discussion, metaphorically speaking, to the, uh, the, the guest of honor, I guess, who's going to read from his book, Assad. All right, can everyone hear me? Okay, I would first like to thank uh, the entire panel of people here who have agreed to participate in this event and have produced brilliant intellectual and political work that I think is very much in line with what I am trying to do. Uh, I would like to thank Wes and Ben and the rest of the staff of Verso uh, for, <laughs> for the work they have done uh, organizing this event and everything else basically that, has, that relates to the book and me appearing in public. Uh, and I would finally like to thank all of you for coming to hear about my little book. Uh, since the subtitle of the book announces that it is about the age of Trump, uh, I'm going to read a few sections uh, which are about categories where, which were decisive in the construction of Trump's political program, and race to be sure is one of them, but also nation, citizen, and migrant. This is from the last chapter. The immigrant represents a core problem for political thought, not a new one engineered by Trump and his associates, but one at least as old as the nation state itself. The fundamental contradiction of the nation state, as Etienne Balibar has pointed out, is the confrontation and reciprocal interaction between two ways of defining the people. First, ethnos, an imagined community of membership and filiation. Second, demos, the collective subject of representation, decision-making, and rights. The first sense of the people internalizes the national border. It is the wall Trump, holds to, Trump hopes to build inside our heads. It is a feeling of belonging to a fictive ethnicity, an imaginary community that is constituted by national borders, but in reality consists of heterogeneous populations brought together by migration and movement, a plurality suppressed by the fantasy of a unitary racial and spiritual essence. The second sense of the people is the political one, the one that appears to be manifested in our Bill of Rights. It is meant to apply regardless of identity. It is a song of the Statue of Liberty which offers its freedoms to all the huddled masses yearning to breathe free, indifferent to their particularities. The contradiction between these two notions is the original sin of the American nation state. It is stated in the first sentence of its first official document. We the people, says the preamble of the Constitution, written by slave owners. As Balibar points out, this construction ties the democratic universality of human rights with particular national belonging. And this is why the democratic composition of the people in the form of the nation inevitably leads to systems of exclusion. The various divisions between so-called majorities and minorities, and even more significantly, between populations considered native and those considered foreign, heterogeneous, who are racially or culturally stigmatized. This democratic contradiction came clearly to the surface in the French Revolution, with its declaration of the rights of man and citizen. In 1843, a young Karl Marx subjected this declaration to critical scrutiny. In On the Jewish Question, Marx pointed out that secular political emancipation, the separation of church and state in the name of universal rights, had not actually overcome religious superstition in practice. Famously and prophetically, he cited the United States as his example. This was because rights were granted to individuals, Marx argued and were therefore the rights of egoistic man, of man separated from other men and from the community. Protecting the individual's rights in the political sphere 
did not mean the end of oppression by religious authorities and the owners of property. This implies a paradox for liberalism that, pers that persists to this day. When rights are granted to empty, abstract individuals, they ignore the real social forms of inequality and oppression that appear to be outside the political sphere. Yet when the particularities of injured identities are brought into the content of rights, as Wendy Brown has pointed out, they are more likely to become sites of the production and regulation of identity as injury than vehicles of emancipation. In other words, when the liberal language of rights is used to defend a concrete identity group from injury, physical or verbal, that group ends up defined by its victimhood and individuals end up reduced to their victimized belonging. Is it possible to go beyond the liberal paradigm of victimhood and the paradox of rights? We have a strong historical basis for doing so if we understand this paradox as the expression of a concrete political antagonism, as Massimiliano Tomba does in his comparison of two versions of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man. The first declaration of 1789, Tomba argues, grounds rights in a juridical universalism, the universalism that comes from above and that implies a subject of right who is either passive or a victim who requires protection, protection from the state. The 1793 Declaration, in contrast, manifests an insurgent universality, one brought onto the historical stage by the slave uprisings of the Haitian Revolution, the intervention of women into the political process that had excluded them, and the demands of the sans culotte for a right to food and life. It does not presuppose any abstract bearer of rights, Tomba says, but instead refers to particular and concrete individuals, women, the poor, and slaves, and their political and social agency. Here we encounter a new paradox. The universality of these particular and concrete individuals acting in their specific situation is more universal than the juridical universalism of the abstract bearers of rights. Indeed, those whom liberal thought reduces to passive victims have always been active agents of politics, the source of insurgent universality. In the words of C.L.R. James, the struggle of the masses for universality did not begin yesterday. Paul Gilroy's groundbreaking book, The Black Atlantic, shows that black radical intellectuals who adopted the heritage of the Enlightenment, as was foreshadowed in the Haitian Revolution, came to articulate a counterculture of modernity. This was precisely an example of a foundational alterity, otherness, that is summed up in the word diaspora and bridges between the African and Jewish experiences. Diaspora, Gilroy argues, disrupts the idea of cultural nationalism and the over-integrated conceptions of culture which present immutable ethnic differences as an absolute break in the histories and experiences of black and white people. It forces us to confront a far more difficult and complicated reality, creolization, metissage, mestizaje, and hybridity, which from the viewpoint of ethnic absolutism are little more than a litany of pollution and impurity. But such an ethnic absolutism, Gilroy powerfully shows, obscures the rich cultural legacies that emerge from the processes of cultural mutation and, relent and restless discontinuity that exceed racial discourse and avoid capture by its agents. Founding member of the Combahee River Collective, Demita Frazier, has pointed out that this excess beyond identity was already at work in the collective's initial proposal of the term identity politics in 1977. I quote, we never actually, as far as I can tell, as far as the classic definition, really practiced what people now call identity politics. Because the centerpiece and the center focus was not an aspect of our identity, but the totality of what it meant to be a black woman in the diaspora. That was Demita Frazier. However, embracing the radical counterculture of modernity does not mean an uncritical embrace of the European Enlightenment. Gilroy criticizes the celebration of European intellectual history as a manifestation of today's conservative complacency, which romanticizes the European past and seeks quietly to reinstate the innocent, unreflexive universalisms liberal, religious, and ethnocentric. 
These analyses remain substantially unaffected by well-known histories of barbarity, ignoring the fact that the universe, universality and rationality of enlightened Europe and America were used to sustain and relocate rather than eradicate an order of racial difference inherited from the pre-modern era. So a universal position can only be achieved if we are serious about reckoning with colonial modernity. If we draw on the black Atlantic counterculture to put forth what Gilroy calls a strategic universalism that goes beyond Europe. Universality does not exist in the abstract as a prescriptive principle which is mechanically applied to indifferent circumstances. It is created and recreated in the act of insurgency which does not demand emancipation solely for those who share my identity, but for everyone. It says that no one will be enslaved. It equally refuses to freeze the oppressed in a status of victimhood that requires protection from above. It insists that emancipation is self-emancipation. Now, rather than continuing to read from my book, I would like to do something that is a little unfair to my guests. Uh, and I would like to read some excerpts from a poem by Amiri Baraka who I discuss at length in my book. I obviously can't even begin to approximate the virtuosity with which Baraka read his poetry, and if you have never heard it, go and uh, find it on YouTube. Uh, but I nevertheless feel a sort of responsibility for uh, bringing attention to the suppressed and unfairly maligned poetry that he produced in the late 1970s, which is now completely out of print. Mm -hmm. And this poem is, uh, these are excerpts from a poem which is in Poetry for the Advanced from 1979. Its title is, The Race Line is the Product of Capitalism. Once again, I apologize to my guests for having to follow a poem by Amiri Baraka. <laughs> it's not read by him, so it's okay. Okay, today, there's no need for backwardness among us. We all went through the 60s, I'm talking to you. Veterans and 40-ish Swifties, been here for a while. You mature folks, young in the 50s when King was doing his thing and Train was just going to Miles and Malcolm was convincing Elijah that the nation needed a newspaper. You know, some of the things that have gone down. Even the purely perceptual, what is that? The purely surface, fragmented, splintered consciousness, no. No, something went down. 50s to 60s to now, in the 70s, no. No, something. There's no need, no need for backwardness. Yet there is always uneven development, even among the masses, the advanced, the average, the backward. But so much has gone down. There's no need for backwardness. Let it go. Let the race line go. Our resistance to terror is revolution. It will sweep the whole slate clean. It will right these centuries of wrongs. It will set the conditions for the destruction of racism and women's oppression, and forever the ancient rule of the minority and every form of slavery. Come from the 30s, grew in the 40s, shaped in the 50s, fought in the 60s, it's time now to reap the harvest of consciousness, of raised understanding. There's no need for backwardness if you claim to be the advanced. Uneven development, yet there are the advanced, whose grasp of the science will create the instrument of all our liberation. The people have no weapon but organization. It is class struggle that is the key link the people grasp as the makers of history. It is class struggle and revolution that raise the whole world up. Spit out the rulers' narcotic teaching, then spit out the rulers themselves. Humanity is divided only by oppression. So uh, thank you so much, and we are going to now have some responses from the panelists. So we'll start with you, Robin. Great, thank you. Um, everyone can hear me? Good. Keep no? Going. No? Better? Okay. Um, first, I just want to thank uh, Assad for writing this book and inviting me to participate in this discussion. Thanks to Verso for publishing uh, this remarkable book, and thanks to all of you uh, for being in attendance. Um, I read the manuscript over the last um, couple of days. In fact, it took me two days to read the manuscript, which suggests, um, illustrates just how um, readable 
and engaging um, the book is, and you heard a little bit of that in the in the reading. But um, I just want to say that um, this work is um, at once um, sort of scholarly and um, incredibly timely and relevant and engaging. And so um, you feel like you are uh, the, the 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 experience, the readerly experience, is the experience of both um, profound learning and. Um, provocation and uh, solidarity. So um, thank you for uh, writing this just really terrific book. Um, I, I just want to focus on a couple of arguments that Assad makes in uh, this book, not so much that came out in, um, in his remarks, but um, I'll reconstruct the arguments um, so that you get a sense of uh, a part of what's going on in the book and then try to um, respond um, or raise some questions about these arguments. One of the really provocative arguments that Assad makes in this book is that identity politics as we now know it and now understand it um, is a very distinct political strategy, a political strategy that Assad describes as a strategy of neutralization. Right? So as Assad understands it, um, identity politics as we now know it emerges as a decisive political effort to neutralize a more radical political project for emancipation, right? So he understands uh, identity politics as a political strategy and a political strategy um, on behalf of uh, neutralization. And in fact, he provides this really beautiful reconstruction of the early civil rights movements, the kind of radical revolutionary beginnings and origins of the civil rights movement to show that in fact, um, the civil rights movement was deeply tied to um, both communist parties and the history of, uh, of the communist party, um, but also workers organization and union movements and anti-poverty efforts and so forth. And so he really tries to uh, kind of dig up this early radical history of the civil rights movement to show that in fact, to the extent that these early figures invoked the language of identity, that they invoked the language of identity already anticipating how that language might be co-opted and colonized by uh, forces of uh, opposition and reaction. And the analysis, the historical analysis is really elegant. It did remind me of uh, Fanon and Franz Fanon's argument about um, nonviolence. So here's what I would want to say, and I'm very interested in uh, Assad's um, response to this, uh, this reading or this interpretive connection that I'm going to try to draw. I think Fanon, and many of you are probably familiar with his uh, famous chapter of the Wretched of the Earth on, on violence, and I think Fanon has often been misread in that chapter as giving us something like an argument for or against nonviolence, where I think that's not at all Fanon's point. I think what Fanon is doing there is giving us an analytic of violence that shows how the discourse of nonviolence, of course discourse wouldn't have been his term, right? But how the discourse of nonviolence emerges in real political time, right? As a response to previous efforts at mobilization and decolonization. So the point is not that Fanon is against nonviolence or for nonviolence for that matter. What he's interested instead is in locating the strategy of nonviolence as a strategy which emerges in real political time in response to efforts by the people to mobilize on behalf of their freedom. So the point for Fanon is not to take a position against nonviolence, as if the sort of abstract position taking is really what's at issue. The point instead is to locate a specific political strategy in real historical time. And I think that's very much what Assad is doing in this book, trying to locate identity politics in real political time, showing how it's not about being for or against identity politics in some very abstract, quasi-metaphysical way. Instead, it's about locating a particular political strategy 
in political time to show how, in a materialist fashion, that strategy emerges in reaction to more radical efforts at mobilization. And so, of course, there is an argument in the book against identity politics, right? But if that argument is properly materialist, right, and not simply a kind of abstract and dare I say it, idealist polemic against identity politics. The point is not to be for or against the thing. The point is instead to understand it and map it as a political strategy and to see its history and identify its history. Hence the importance of the historical reconstruction of the civil rights movement that Assad provides. Fantastic. So the first question that I would have is whether he accepts um, a certain kind of analytic parallel there between what um, Fanon is doing with respect to nonviolence, if he accepts my reading of Fanon on nonviolence, and if he accepts a certain, I don't know, kind of methodological parallel. But following up on that, sort of building on that, the enduring question that I had about the historical reconstruction that Assad provides has to do with Garveyism. Namely, um, Assad gives us this really beautiful reconstruction of the radical origins of the civil rights movement. The way in which figures like Rosa Parks was politicized through workers' movements and communist movements, right? And so what he's very much trying to do is amplify the left-wing project that has always been at the foundations of the civil rights movement. But then I wondered about this other thing that is also part of the early history of the civil rights movement, which we couldn't call left wing. We just simply couldn't, right? And so um, what should we call Garveyism? Mm. How should we figure Garveyism in the development of this complicated, rich, fraught, um, multiple civil rights history that you're reconstructing. And if we pay attention to Garveyism, then does our story, does our historical narrative become a little bit more complicated than simply the left-wing origins of civil rights and then the reaction formation against it? Hmm. Finally, I would just like to raise another um, argument that Assad makes in the book where he says, listen, one of the sort of profound limits of contemporary identity politics and our, um, and the sort of present day language of intersectionality is that it fails to understand the extent to which, this is how Assad puts it, that race and class are distinct social relations. Right? And that we have a, a tendency to reduce or flatten these very distinct forms of uh, social relation and that um, lands in a kind of uh, reductivism. But he also makes the argument following others that slavery is capitalism in the extreme and that racial domination is a species of capitalist domination. And I think he beautifully and marvelously holds both of these positions at once in the book. And I'm not even trying to say that you can't hold both of these positions at once, but I would like to hear Assad kind of talk through how he manages to hold both of these positions at once. <laughs> Finally, um, I would like very much to hear Assad um, say a little bit more about um, this concept of emancipation or his ideal of emancipation as it informs the liberatory politics um, of the book. So part of what I'm uh, working on in, in my own research right now um, is a project on authority in the family, um, an effort to develop a feminist political critique of authority and the family. And I'm toying with um, sort of playing with this concept of emancipation as a principle potentially usefully applied to the family. And one of the things that I've learned about emancipation is that it's actually 
Um, apropos, it's an appropriate concept to bring to bear on the politics of the family because after all, um, the juridical origins of the concept of emancipation right, has to do with uh, liberation from fatherly authority. Right? So emancipation for the Romans was precisely liberation or independence from the authority of the father. And in turn, right, the father's release from obligations to his wife or children. Now it's quite interesting to me how the language of emancipation has migrated outside of the family and outside of uh, the specific authority relations and kind of structural dependencies that we um, sort of might identify with the family. I quite love that it has migrated outside of the family, but I'm wondering um, whether uh, feminist uh, research and feminist accounts of the structural domination in the family is not um, essential to our understanding of what an emancipatory politics or an emancipatory vision might look like today. Thanks. And again, that was Robin Morasco, who's a political scientist. Um, and we are going to delve into this, the Assadism, if you will, uh, here. But, sorry. but just to clarify, we're going to have the, all the people participate, all the panelists uh, respond, and then As Assad will respond in one fell swoop. Just so, right? Which, and we're keeping notes. But so you guys are going to be in suspense for a little bit more. Thank you so much. And um, now we're going to hear from Wendell Hassan Marsh, who again is the professor of African American and African Studies at Rutgers. So thank you uh, for the invitation, Assad, and uh, thank you uh, to Verso for um, hosting this event. Uh, I want to begin really by kind of affirming this uh, insurgent universality. Uh, Assad describes it as the project of universal emancipation, a global revolutionary solidarity through organization and action. And um, you know, given uh, today being the anniversary, uh, 70th, 70 years um, after the, the Nakba, I just want to take a very brief moment to recognize the ongoing struggles uh, in Gaza and, and Palestine. So um, the two main points that I want to make uh, is I, I really appreciate the way in which uh, Assad pays attention to the kind of excess of politics, right? These kind of psychic and emotive dimensions that uh, make it so that in politics, one plus one rarely equals two. Uh, and the second point I want to make up front, because I'll probably lose track, is uh, the question of, kind of similar to Robin's question, uh, about black nationalism and how we understand black nationalism uh, in relation to uh, uh, contemporary politics. So uh, one of the things that I found interesting in the introduction when um, Assad gives this uh, kind of great narration of not only his ideas, but how uh, he came to them, um, he kind of describes uh, a, a very complex journey uh, between central Pennsylvania and Pakistan, uh, but also coming of age in um, after September 11th, and uh, what he calls the double bind. And um, to, ex to explain the double bind, he, uh, really relies on some discoveries that he made as a high school student uh, in Huey P. Newton and Malcolm X. So he kind of describes his initial engagement with these two thinkers and their kind of uh, proto-critiques of what uh, becomes identity politics. And Assad says that uh, there, were no real so there was no real solution to the double bind they had put me in, the Muslims and the whites. Was it possible to respond to the attacks on Muslims without rationalizing the conservative and reactionary ideology of Islam? On the other hand, was it possible to criticize the damage wrought by Islamic fundamentalism without playing into the hands of white racists? 
Assad then goes on to kind of describe his attempts to get out of this double bind, especially through what he calls political rationalism. Uh, but uh, very quickly, within two pages, he recognizes that uh, you can't throw facts at uh, the problem. And that moment reminded me uh, of Du Bois, actually. Um, there's a interview with Du Bois. He's very old, and he's remembering what accounted for his shift in politics. It was the 1906 race riots in Atlanta where he had been involved with this exhaustive study of uh, kind of uh, reconstruction and uh, the, 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 you know, the, the black belt. And he's called home and he has to defend his family with a shotgun um, overnight during the, the race riots. And he says that this is the moment when he realizes it's not just a matter of information. It's not just a matter of knowing, uh, but uh, it required a kind of action. And Assad would probably say organization. And so this was, a, uh, from, from this point in the, the narrative that Assad writes, that he starts to uh, think in, uh, we, in a way that we might call excessive, right? He's, he's thinking about um, these, uh, maybe diagonal or inconsistent or incongruent uh, elements that make um, politics uh, as messy and complicated as they are. And it's, it's there really that I think one of the more controversial chapters, uh, what will become the more controversial chapters in his book on, on, uh, on passing, uh, where he really points to the way in which, uh, you know, in societies structured in, in, in domination, there's a way in which um, certain identities uh, kind of bear the, the, the weight or the burden of power, uh, whether the dominated or the domin kind of a uh, dominating uh, identity. But with, with that in mind, I, I want to point out that uh, given the kind of excess of identities, given the, um, the, the, the problems of kind of settling on a, a clear arithmetic on how to uh, address a political problem, then, you know, given that, uh, if we think back to what Assad called the double bind uh, of a historical moment in which uh, now a Muslim is an identity, right? Uh, before 9-11, uh, to be Muslim wasn't really an identity in the way that it becomes an identity in America uh, after 9-11. And here also I wanted to point out that uh, Islam is not an ideology. Uh, you know, some 1400 years, uh, there have been many ideologies in different historical moments that really warrant some kind of uh, reflection um, beyond the kind of, you know, thinking about a particular w form that it takes in a particular set of politics in a moment that uh, participates in the making of this historical moment in which uh, this ap appears as a double bind. And so, one of the things that's interesting to me uh, is the kind of archive that Assad uh, is attracted by or kind of finds himself in is very much inflected by um, movements that uh, some may describe as a kind of proto-identity uh, pol politics. In the book itself, you know, he makes this distinction following Huey P. Newton about reactionary nationalism as opposed to revolutionary nationalism, which is very good, but um, there are these stages for both uh, Malcolm X and Amiri Baraka, in which black nationalism, Islam, are uh, very important elements of, a, of black autonomy, 
right? So um, how might we make sense then of um, uh, the kind of appearance and the reappearance of, uh, of these elements which on the face of it uh, seem to appeal to a kind of identity politics? I would, I would suggest, uh, and this is only kind of provisional, uh, it warrants concrete uh, thinking, concrete analysis, but uh, the kind of thinking about Garveyism and thinking about uh, various histories of black nationalist projects, uh, given their relationship to a, a kind of a, a, a dominant state that there is an opening of some kind. Uh, there is uh, a, a space, there's a process, um, a set of opportunities that emerge within uh, a context in which, um, uh, you know, the possibility of uh, black autonomy is, is dangerous or of a Muslim autonomy is dangerous. Uh, and I think uh, if we think about the excessiveness of, of uh, politics, the, uh, these kind of emotive psychic dimensions, and thinking about the, the, the kind of work that people like Garvey, the people like Malcolm X, the people like Huey P. Newton, who are really directed about um, emancipating uh, the, the individual in a larger process of collective uh, liberation, uh, th we need to kind of maintain some space for autonomous activity uh, self-organization that, uh, you know, might appear to some as an identity politics, right? I don't want to completely, uh, uh, you know, I, what I fear is this critique being kind of instrumentalized, uh, you know, by, you know, um, as you describe in the double bind, to be instrumentalized by, um, you know, kind of white leftists who have no patience for self-activity uh, self of, of, you know, um, black organizations, uh, for example. So how do we think about, cre you know, creating um, uh, movements that allow for that kind of processual and that ex excessiveness? Again, thank you so much, uh, Wendell Hassan Marsh. And we are now going to hear from uh, Brianna Gray, Brianna Joy Gray. Um, so I want to be the third to thank uh, Assad for the invitation. I was very excited to get it. Uh, I was very excited to get his invitation and to hear and to hear that uh, a book had been written on this subject because it is, in fact, one of my all-time favorite subjects. <laughs> And in many ways, it's a subject which has drawn me into a career as a writer and has facilitated my shift away from the law. So I will forever be grateful to it and will always have a special place in my heart. Um, <laughs> I come to this from a less academic perspective. Um, as was mentioned, I was simply an attorney uh, a year ago uh, this month, sitting at my computer, deeply frustrated by the way the conversation um, about the 2016 election uh, continued to unfold, particularly as someone whose very identity um, undermined what the media was describing as the kind of singular identity of people who supported um, the progressive movement um, and Bernie Sanders. I was this black female Bernie bro. Um, and over the course of 2016, you might imagine, I became pretty frustrated at um, kind of characterizations and um, uh, an understanding of politics which basically required me not to exist. Um, my existence <laughs> was kind of um, a pathway toward the ultimate recognition that there was something happening here um, that didn't ring true, and in fact appeared to be uh, politically motivated, um, as Assad describes in his book. Um, so, you know, Something that I've written about um, at length then is about what I described as the weaponization of identity. 
So, um, you know, one of the things that became clear to me is that people were defining identity politics in very different ways. And that's how you got to a place where people who I think generally all uh, held the same ideas about the value of race um, and understood uh, the legacy of historical marginali marginalization of various um, identity groups had such very different perception about how race should be handled politically. So you had people at the center who seemed to uh, invest a certain primacy with race uh, with respect to how they perceived what was happening politically in a very broad way. And to be more specific about it, there was a way in which someone's identity, whether it's a racial identity, a gender identity, a sexual orientation, et cetera, became the primary vehicle for, through which you could understand their politics. Therefore, you got to a place where it didn't matter if um, somebody, let's say, hypothetically, chose a VP candidate who would, <laughs> would repeal the, you know, who supported the Hyde Amendment, you know, you, it did, if she were a woman. It didn't matter if you have a 2020 candidate who um, was a prosecutor who bragged about their ability to incarcerate um, people, primarily people of color, if she and herself was a person of color and also it's helpful that she's a woman. Um, and any critique of these figures for those reasons became a critique of their identity instead of their substantive politics. And the line between the two was completely blurred. Um, I think that's why, for me, the subject is so important in a book like this, which is able to draw on historical examples of the ways in which the concept of identity as first um, imagined by the women of the Kumbahi uh, River Collective has been so uh, bastardized. Um, part of why that's so important to me is because uh, the histor ability to make historical references is so important to me. It's because even into, this, into the present, critiques... Um, of identity politics are still broadly perceived as an attack on the idea of racial or um, gender, et cetera, identity in and of itself. So to be able to ground the critique in, frankly, people of color who are well respected by the same people who um, put such a primacy on identity um, is really effective and important. Now I also appreciate the irony there. Like there is a way in which you're playing the identity politics game, and I'm not saying that you're doing this, but this is something that I know that I'm actively doing, right? As a black woman writing these articles, I know that I have had some traction in the media because of my own identity. I feel a responsibility to write some of these articles because of my identity. But the reality is I am participating in identity politics by being the black Bernie broad, right? So, um, my question then, and when I was reading this book, one of the things that I, you know, kept going around and around is that, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, I think a point that Robin made was that there isn't a, you know, this shouldn't be necessarily perceived as a, an argument for or against identity. When I read it, I did perceive it somewhat as an argument against. I mean, there's several points at which you talk about the ways that identity is an obstacle um, to kind of collective action um, and the, way, the ways that it can be a distraction. And these are ways that I have um, written about, uh, uh, things that I've written about myself. Um, I think I would perhaps make the distinction um, between identity politics as a problem and the weaponization of polit identity politics as a problem. And I do that not because I don't substantively agree with the vast majority of what was written in this book, but because we do continue to live in a world where critiques of identity politics are very, very vulnerable to identity politics. <laughs> so, you know, I know that there exists um, a real sensitivity, and a sensitivity that is not entirely unearned. Um, but there's a real sensitivity among people of color especially for critiques that seem to undermine or not sufficiently acknowledge their personal life lived experiences and the ways in which their identity as uh, um, genuinely does affect their lives. And of course, you know, we, we know the ways in which race is a social contract, construct and, you know, the, uh, ephemeral and, and I think that the lessons of, um, you know, that we shouldn't um, kind of speak race into being the way the Field Sisters talk about, um, right? Like, there's a way in which that we we can, um, when we talk about race, when we talk about, for example, um, Trump as a president for white people, we can kind of speak into being an alliance that isn't necessarily true, right? I, I wrote an article for Rolling Stone which argued that Trump is a 
president for rich people. And there's not necessarily a lot of inconsistency with someone like Kanye West, hypothetically, um, aligning his interest with, with Trump's. So I, I want to be sensitive to that. But at the same time, you know, people hear a critique of identity politics and they also hear a critique of who they are and the real reality of their lived experiences. And so I'm curious also about you know, how we can be careful with our language so that those, um, those differences um, aren't erased. And I know that when I've, I've written, in order to kind of heat that stuff off of, at the past, I've had to include caveat after caveat after caveat um, in, into my pieces, wasting precious words that I would love to be spending on other kinds of things. But the reality is I, I pulled up um, my first identity politics article just to remind myself, and I'm like, holy smokes, that's like a long <laughs> paragraph in which I feel like I have to open by saying having an identity politics is incredibly beneficial. Identity politics, which and then I give a definition, mm -hmm. right? Because part of the problem is there are a lot of definitions floating around. Um, so I, I define it as something that emphasizes the unique concerns of different communities and demographic groups, shows his historical inequities have been distributed across different races, genders, religions, abilities, and sexualities. And in doing so, it allows us to better understand how to critique and reform the systems that replicate those inequities. And I give some examples of foreclosure crisis, um, disparate effects, and all these other kinds of things. Because I, I know that when a lot of people of color hear that critique, the critique of identity politics and the way it's been weaponized, they're hearing, oh, you're telling me that racism isn't real. You're telling me that there aren't dis disparate effects that, affects, that affect all of these um, historically marginalized communities. So my question um, to Assad is, you know, how do we negotiate this? How do we, it, should we, and this is, I think, a similar question that both of you also raised, how do we make a space for the reality of identity as a kind of a cultural um, institution in, in this country and, and in the world? Um, and, you know, there, there are, the, going to, back also to the passage that you read, this, identi this idea of kind of um, identity, uh, a call for um, kind of um, uh, demanding this, uh, making a demand of the state because of your identity, to be uh, for equality on the basis of identity as a way to kind of enshrine your, your victim status, that's something that I struggled with quite a, you know, a little bit while reading this because it is something that you hear a lot from the right, right? That there is a, a culture of victimhood and that somehow the, the subtext of that, that rhetoric is that the grievance, the underlying grievance is not in fact real. And I don't think that that's, I don't think that's what you're saying at all, but I don't know exactly how to define victimhood um, in a way that's not positive without the implication that the underlying grievance isn't real. See what I'm saying? <laughs> like the double bind <laughs> question that he raises in the book. Um, and yeah, maybe, maybe I'll leave it there, but just more like very, very broadly, you know, what if any value does the idea of race and racial identity have um, to this narrative and also to coalition building generally. Can race or any other kind of identity be an entry point into um, um, collective action as opposed to simply merely only a hurdle? Um, this is something you know, you know, that I've written hoping that you know, Senator Sanders understands. My, 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 um, Who you met. <laughs> my met. But my, cri my critique to him has been show the ways in which your universal programs aren't just universal, but also specific. Not necessarily divorce, you know, um, a critique of the identity itself, but if people are identifying themselves by these various um, features, show them how those characteristics are not excluded by a more universal uh, class-based um, message. You want us to repeat every, all the questions? And, just kidding. So uh, I don't want to talk too long because I want to hear from all of you, but uh, I feel um, in the notes I have been taking, I've been compelled to start writing another book. <laughs> but I want to pick up on some things that, uh, some aspects of the book that each of the panelists has very... Um, uh, acutely identified and, and, and they have also identified uh, 
questions for further uh, political disputation or historical research. Let me say, first of all, there is the problem of definitions. And uh, I, I, I'm very grateful to have had the Hegel scholar on the panel suggest that I did not lapse into idealism. That, that was great. Um, but Robin has proposed a kind of beautiful way of framing it, which is the question of political time. How does a particular word take on a different meaning uh, throughout a process of political time, a process of political change? Uh, right now, the word identity politics seems to be given a different definition by everyone who uses it. And then in a discussion, you have at least two, uh, three, four, five definitions at play. Or maybe even one person will be using two, three different definitions in their own discussion. Uh, this is why I avoid definitions. OK. Because I, uh, the, 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 the thing about political language is that definitions are contested. And definitions are generated by the struggle that is fought over the meaning of a particular word or set of words. And what is interesting about the term identity politics, and this is why I give a history rather than a definition in the first chapter uh, based on the Kambahi River Collective, is to show how identity politics is used, is proposed as a term in order to challenge the exclusionary character of existing social movements, the feminist movement which revolved around white women, the black liberation movement which assumed the position of black men. The, 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 the very identity of black women was disruptive to these reductive identity categories. And it made it possible, if you look now at the book that uh, uh, the, the republication of the Combahee River Collective uh, Statement um, uh, called How We Get Free, edited by Kiang Yamada Taylor with interviews with many of the participants. The idea is if black women get free, then everybody gets free because we are the ones who have been excluded completely for, uh, in terms of identity from all of these existing social movements. Now, how is it that you get from that to the situation in which Brianna ceases to exist? Something has changed. Something has politically changed in the content of this, of this term. And, and so that is why my approach is, to, is not to reclaim the word, but to try to say, how is it that this word, this term, contains within it an irreconcilable political antagonist? OK, I'll leave uh, that there. Uh, to be fair, um, it's, she may exist. She's just doing everything she does for straight white men's approval. That's, that, I that's just the argument. That I'm a yes. regular Stacey Dash. Yeah. OK. <laughs> uh, now, on the, 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 there's a question of Garveyism and a question of black nationalism, the cultural nationalism that you, Amiri Baraka once adhered to, which I spend a lot of time on, uh, the kind of much more, I think, much more complicated nationalism of Malcolm X, because uh, Malcolm X's nationalism is drawn from uh, a cosmology which is, which, which I mean, it, it's there are Jewish components, there are Christian components. The, na the nation of Islam is not reducible to one kind of uh, 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 lineage in Islam or anything that came uh, autochthonously from the black community of the United States. So this is different. Now, Garveyism, there is no question, represented one of the major mass movements uh, against racial oppression in the United States in the early 20th century. And it was the demand for a separate black nation. Uh, some of the Communist Party history that I include in the book, and I skip this step here, but you can read about it elsewhere, is the specific attempt of communists with, uh, of, of black members of the Communist Party trying to explain why Garveyism could not be simply dismissed mm -hmm. or rejected as, as just a fantasy or pure nationalism that was inherently uh, opposed to uh, their agenda. And the way that this happened was that 
the uh, oppression of black people in the United States was tied in to what was uh, proposed in the Third International as the national and colonial questions. So the, I, the oppression of black people in the United States was not some exceptional case. And the United States was not exceptional from the rest of the world. It did not have its own sort of terms of politics. It was part of the global colonial context in which uh, the, the, the non-Western world had been subjected to colonial violence and domination, and movements for self-determination emerged that attacked capitalist imperialism at the core. And these were movements in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. And uh, in the analysis of these black communists, Garveyism was one of those movements. So the, the proposal then in 1928 and 1930, the common turn takes up the idea that there is, an, there is a black nation in the black belt south and that it has the right to raise the demand of self-determination. That is the communist response to Garveyism. Okay, to tie the demand for self-determination into the global national and colonial questions, into the global revolutionary question. And to read about this, you can read uh, the autobiography of the black communist Harry Haywood, who wrote the Black Belt Thesis. It has been published in a bridged form as a black communist in the freedom struggle. And in its complete form of 900 pages, it is called Black Bolshevik. And I, of course, encourage the reading of the 900 pages of the one with a better title. Uh, there's so much more I can say. I want to let, um, I, I want to let um, your own questions and concerns, which may resonate with what has already been raised, raised, determine what I'm going to say. Otherwise, I will have to spend the whole time defending myself against these uh, brilliant critics. So uh, I will leave it at that. Yeah. Thanks. So we are going to open it up to questions from the audience, and thanks again so much to the panel. Um, should, do you want people to come up to Mike? How do you want them to do this? Oh, okay. Three, Three at a time, time, come up, please. Good. By the way, while we're transitioning to this section, I just wanted to say um, shout out to Chuck, you mentioned Gaza, and uh, shout out to Chuck Schumer for being as responsible for what's happening uh, there now uh, as Donald Trump is. So as a, as a secular Jew, I'm very verklempt uh, by that. No, seriously, he's what you'd call a Shonda. This is something I think really related to identity politics and something that we need to be talking about, which is the fact that, again, Chuck Schumer is bragging about his role in, help, in making Trump move the embassy to Jerusalem. And then on a, a lighter note, I wanted to share, as I said, I've had some... Um, uh, I was blessed with having um, Assad and Bree both on my podcast, and I've started to do stuff for the Young Turks, which I know is a, in this circle, a right-wing organization. But um, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I, I, when we spoke about identity politics and I released a part on my podcast, um, some, some people were really upset by it, and because we, we spoke about Joy Reid, and Brianna made the fatal mistake of, of criticizing her at all. Um, and so uh, a white woman, a brave white woman on Twitter, who I won't name, but feel free to come up after me. I'll show your handle. Um, <laughs> she said, uh, let's face it, with the racism and sexism, a powerful woman like Joy Reid is their worst effing nightmare. You coming after Joy, you'll have to come through me first. I'll lay your whiny ass, A-Z-Z, -Z, out. All for one, one for all. So I just wanted to share that so that you guys felt the power of... Um, uh, you know, the weaponization of identity politics and what it can bring us to. All right. I thought the. I, thought I you saw a see. hand in the back. I'm not going to read any tweet. I'm not going to. Yeah. I have questions, obviously, but. No. This is, is this like infiltrated by a bunch of right wingers? Why, why are there no. Qu <laughs> Where's the I saw a, the I fake saw a hand. Uh, I don't know if comments. it's uh, faded, but uh, maybe the mic can trap. Yeah. No, no, you, 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 he, the mic will come to you. Good negotiators. So one of the first things you said was, we the people. Yeah. And I wonder, it has taken me a long time to figure out that we the people pretty much means white, male, 
property owners. And as a person that grew up in Michigan, I've always described myself as an American, I didn't really realize that other Americans don't consider me the people. And so just, I don't know. I mean, I'm just wondering if identity, you have to think about it, but then also there is a kind of American who does not think that any other person but white male owners of property are the people. How do we deal with that? We're taking three. Can, can you just to clarify what, why do you say they don't consider you that because of what reason? Okay, so, so you're saying, so, so for people, they're, they're people for whom if you're not a white man, you're just not considered part of the national project. Yeah, okay. Can, like wanted, now. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I like it, to make sure I understood. 240 what years later, after I was born in Michigan a long time, yeah. you know, it, that Trumpism is that white men are the people and no one else is. We'll take two more. There's one over there. Yeah, so at the, uh, the outset, um, you contrast the two uh, conceptions of the people under the agent, uh, ages of the nation state, ethnos and demos, and I was wondering um, if you had any thoughts uh, on how that maps on to um, French political nationalism and, and German romantic nationalism and how those two conceptions of the nation um, kind of extended our uh, understanding of identity um, into modernity in the contemporary era. And then there was one more, oh, oh there, sorry, and then the, over there. Um, so in, in the book, you talk about how you were um, somewhere inspired to write this analysis based on debates within the Santa Cruz student movement around identity, safe spaces, et cetera. And so maybe moving somewhat from the abstract to the concrete, I'm curious if you want to talk a little bit about the implications of this analysis and these debates for contemporary struggles, um, the limits that... Um, some theoretical frameworks may or may not place on contemporary struggles, and particularly the role of um, communist partisans and the opportunities for intervention and tact and stuff like that within them. Take one more. Yeah. Um, I don't feel like my question is especially well formulated, but I'm interested in your thoughts and the panel's thoughts about um, the place of affect in political organizing, because I think that in a lot of ways that's what is underlying some of these questions about how people come to struggle and why they might stay in it, right? And why they might learn and grow politically. Um, and I think um, Brianna's comments, especially about um, the kind of exclusion that you might feel in particular political spaces, I think lots of, um, you know, I'm a college teacher, so college students come to this stuff and they bring all of this um, very intense affective um, attachment to these exact questions. Um, and if they feel um, slighted or they feel as though they are marginalized, right, they get turned off from it. Um, and so my question is about the role of that kind of affective connection and the way in which it is so frequently kind of linked into questions of identity and how we as organizers begin to um, allow people to make a link between that and broader sort of collective action that is happening um, or how we recognize the collective action of things that are going on and how they might link into socialist struggle um, because I think that it's about the importance that we think affect should or should not play mm -hmm. in how people come to political struggle and why they stay in political struggle. Not at all well formulated. <laughs> that was sarcastic. I don't want to be the only one responding, so I do want to throw it out first to the, pa to, to the rest of the panel, and then I'll come in on whatever uh, questions you didn't want to answer. Um, well, to the woman in the back first, I'd say that, um, you know, what strikes me about these conversations about who gets to be and who doesn't get to be considered to be American, um, I once, in, a, in like an intro sociology class in college, uh, had a professor draw on the chalkboard um, an e a graph with the XY axis. And on one axis was um, how much you're liked in America, 
and on the other was how American you're considered to be. Um, and so on the top right, you know, both very American and very well liked are white people. Um, and then um, there's very, very American still, but not well liked at all as black people. <laughs> and then um, very well liked, but not very American as Asian people. And then not liked and also not considered American were Latinos. Okay, and that always struck with me, uh, struck, uh, stayed with me, because there was this weird way in which I recognized that I, it was never really, my Americanness was never really challenged, despite the fact that I feel challenged in many other ways in my identity um, in, in this country. And I think about this a lot as, um, you know, immigration issues are so central to our current political discussion. And um, the, how, you know, how I feel that sometimes excluded by the, the narrative of being a nation of, of immigrants, right? Um, uh, not out of it, like, and whether or not that kind of framing is an obstacle to solidarity. I mean, it's not gonna turn me off. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna you know, become anti-immigrant just because of something like that. But it's something, it's something that I think about on kind of the inverse of that question. And also, uh, it makes me also, your question also made me consider the famous Harlan descent from the Plessy v. Ferguson decision, which is held up um, as this uh, wonderful departure and a kind of like a prescient um, statement of the fact that we should all be equal and black people shouldn't be uh, treated, made to use separate uh, accommodations. But what's often excluded from that dissent when it is quoted is the bit where Harlan goes on and on about how, well, black people are American and they've, paid, they've, they've played their role and they surely should be counted in this country um, as equals. The same does not hold true for the Chinese. And he goes on a lovely little rant about how their innate intrinsic character means that they can never truly be considered American. So that is all to say that I just want to recognize um, that the real, real central reality of your question and that the fact of kind of like model minority status doesn't at all undermine um, the reality that some people still persist in not being considered American even though they're often spoken of as having integrated and you know assimilated and all the things that the right pretends they like. And I don't know um, whether or not white, you know, it, it's challenging because it doesn't, you can make an argument that whiteness is what require, is required to be an American, but then I think that blacks are allowed to be American. And it doesn't seem to be good behavior that gets you to be American because Asians aren't allowed to be American. So I don't really have an answer for you, but just to uh, say that I empathize. <laughs> I think, yeah. I think with respect to rights and privileges, I think there's definitely an argument there. But it def I, don't, I don't feel like my, like no one's coming up to me asking me where I'm from. Right. Right. Like, right. But my, <laughs> my point is that I, that never happens to me. And I, Spent, you know, I grew up actually abroad. I'm my parent. I'm American, but we moved overseas when I was very young. And what I found was when I was abroad, my Americanness was called into question by people who didn't understand the concept of a Black American. But that never is the case when I'm here. I could frankly be not American, and I don't think anybody right. would challenge it as long as I didn't have an accent or an unusual name. You know. You're saying even among pe race, people who have racist ideas or racist, right. they, they still they, they don't they challenge. You. Right, they don't challenge. <laughs> but your... it's not because I'm not American, you know. Okay, so um, I can't think of a single time in my life I was considered American. Uh, <laughs> the one of the leading, um, one of the leading narrative. I mean, Brianna, you brought up the question of the lived experience of people of color, which is what I start with in this book, and it's a specific one, it's the, it's the one of constantly being asked where I'm from, and then uh, finding out that Pennsylvania is not a satisfactory answer, okay? So, fundamentally, I agree uh, that this, this is a fundamental structure of exclusion, and that's exactly what I began with. Uh, I th uh, and, and here, I agree with the kinds of, with, with the, uh, spirit of autonomy that was raised in the context of Garveyism and the Nation of Islam and so on, that I see no need to fashion myself into an American. Uh, 
Okay, I see. I, I think that the, the very foundations of the American nation state uh, should be undermined in favor of an internationalist politics. That is what I think about that. Yeah. I will add that, um, you know, my own experience of exclusion from the category of the American nation has to do with the question of Islam, which Wendell raised and which others have raised. Uh, in which I sort of take a distance from it as a non-believer. But nevertheless, it's the, it's the framing uh, kind of uh, component uh, of my exclusion from the category of Americanness. Now, there, there, were, uh, there were many attempts recently in the mid-2010s, uh, what is that, 15 years ago or so, to uh, sort of rewrite Marx's on the Jewish question and call it on the Muslim question. And that had specifically to do with a particular context the question of French nationalism was raised. And so in France, when the hijab is banned in schools, it has to do with a particular conception of secularism and assimilation as an aspect of what it means to be a French citizen, okay? That is one kind of Muslim question which, which, which aligns pretty closely with the kind of things that Marx was talking about. But the Muslim question that you get in the United States post 9-11 is an entirely different one. It's not about uh, an, uh, a demand for inclusion or a demand for rights. It's about the surveillance of a particular kind of population. So you know there is no one Muslim question in this sense. Mm. Uh, to, to, to adequately address Islam in this book, I would have to address all of these separate particular contexts in which Islam becomes a problem and the identity of Muslim becomes a problem. Okay. So, so I, I think one of the things, the, the, I mean, the book does many things very well. Um, uh, let me be clear about that. Uh, but I think uh, there is a and kind of affective reading here. Uh, Saad doesn't use the language of affect, but he is very much interested in, in what, I, what I've been calling the kind of the excesses of, of politics, right? Um, and so I, I think, th I, I mean, I, th I would want to hear what you have to say on that, but I think it, it's all over the place in this book. Uh, I think it has to be a part of, of our movements. I will say that I, I too am, a, you know, teach in a, a college setting, and in the college classroom, uh, th this is very much a kind of a live uh, question and problem. Uh, this semester recently, there was a, a situation in which um, I realized there was a discussion around slavery, uh, and it was a very mixed uh, classroom. And I, I realized that um, uh, the black students in the class were feeling a kind of discomfort that the non-black students uh, in the class were not experiencing. Um, so I realized that we needed to generalize the discomfort, right? And so before we did that, uh, before we generalized the discomfort, um, there was a certain attitude by a majority of the non-black students about um, needing to do something for black people, right? Um, but after we generalized the discomfort, that completely disappeared, right? There was a different relation uh, with kind of ideas about race and about blackness that was generated inside the classroom space. Um, that I think ultimately, uh, hopefully, would be productive for uh, a politics for those students at some point. It's, it's funny because you, um, you went with Senator Sanders to the South and you actually asked him a question that relates to the question that you asked about affect, or to me it does, which is this question about um, kind of uni universality and, and um, also targeted populations, right? So you asked something of, of Sanders that I think a lot of people in this room think but don't really interrogate, right? Which is like, okay, we all know that economic solutions are, um, are necessary but insufficient, right? But what are the things that are needed that are not economic? Uh, and 
and, and Sanders gave you a list of various programs, yeah. right? Uh, I, I asked someone on the show, on my show that once, and she and I, we've had a falling out, so I won't mention her, but uh, at the time, it wasn't a gotcha. It was like we were both, you know, uh, co-signing what we were saying. And I asked her what she felt as a black woman was uh, missing from these economic programs. And she and I were both like, oh, wait, it's not that there's a policy per se, but when, if we, goes back to affect, if we kind of dismiss things, like if we pretend that being a white worker is the same thing as being a black worker, then it's on an organizational level and a strategy level and a moral level too, but it's just, it's a totally alienating thing. I mean, it's not true, right? But it's just a really important question in terms of affect and organizing, right? Like you may say that, that the solutions to, to, to different issues are universal, tend to be universal, like you were saying this before, kind of like the thing, ironically, that universal programs disproportionately in many cases do help empower um, the, the most marginalized groups in, in the society, right? Not always, but often that is the case. But that's kind of a separate issue from affect, right? If you, if you kind of dismiss people's realities, lived experiences of um, not being straight white men, you're, you know, you're going to lose solidar solidarity opportunities. So I think it's a great question, this question of affect and our affective investments in um, political struggle. And, um, and I guess uh, for me, I would say that, um, right, it's not just about not being dismissive of um, affect and affective investments, but in fact, um, harnessing them, right? And so, um, right, so one thing that I think we absolutely cannot do um, is kind of prop up um, enlightenment rationalism as like somehow the solution to these bad affective energies that would otherwise distract radical politics from the right course. I mean, that just, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna fly. Um, now, desire is really a complicated thing. <laughs> And our desires, as we all know, don't always move in the direction that we initially, as political subjects, want those desires to move. And so it doesn't mean, as radicals or as internationalists, that we have to simply defer to our desires because they're our desires. But, but it does mean that our desires are part of what animates, excites, sort of enlivens our uh, sort of political struggles. And so, sort of for me, part of um, my own work has been, and I don't so much use the language of affect, I, I tend to prefer the language of passion um, for a whole host of reasons. And for me, right, part of um, my own work has to do with kind of recentering the passions in the so called philosophical discourse of modernity, right, to say that um, the story, the philosophical story of modernity is, in fact, not a story only of rationalism, right? But is the story of um, the passions, of desire, of the circulations and the excesses of passion and desire, and in fact those excesses and those energies um, having a kind of collective shape and a collective life. So I'm also a, a college teacher, also dealing with the way that my students come to these issues. Um, but for me it's not about um, sort of learning how to not dismiss them, right? But instead, um, beginning to open up spaces for our own self-reflection on the problematic of desire, right? So like, desire is just gonna be a tricky thing for politics. This comes up, I think, a lot around um, feminist issues and sort of the problem of desire um, and, and the erotics of desire um, in sort of feminist organizing and how that works. I think it comes up in, um, in um, organizing for racial justice. And it seems to me that it's just simply not gonna do to say that like what we need is, is, a, is a better or more robust rationalism. Instead, it seems to me that what we're going to need to do is recognize how our rationalist projects have always been laced with desires and have always been bound up with the circulations of passions and then try to figure out kind of what we do with our passions. Yeah, to that, to that point, I feel like there's, a, there's an argument that says 
let's get rid of identity politics because of the ways in which largely the right characterizes identity politics as somehow biased. I've been working on something in, where I, in which I try to unpack that uh, debate between uh, Ezra Klein and Sam Harris, where Sam Harris basically argues that he hates identity politics because it's a form of bias. And if you can only see things through your racial lens, then that means that there's no convincing anybody of anything. And their whole worldview is completely reduced to how, whoever they happen to be born to be. Um, which is a con conception of identity politics that I think a lot of people, unfortunately, even on the left, hold. That kind of additive way of saying, well, identity politics means that I'm a woman, plus I'm black, therefore that means I have more authority to speak to X, Y, and Z issue than someone who's a woman who is white, but someone who is a woman who is black and also lesbian has more authority to speak to me. And that, as you write, is exactly the opposite of what was intended um, when the CBC invent, like, came up with the term identity politics. The point is to understand that my identity as a straight black woman is different from my, someone else's identity as a gay black woman is different from somebody else's identity as a, a straight white woman. I can't even keep track of where I am right now. Um, <laughs> but, but that those, all of those experiences are real. You have an authority. You have, you know, an authority over your lived, literal lived perspective. No matter what it is, it's not meant to be this thing where you're pulling rank. Except in so far as if you actually have an experience. If I'm actually an attorney, then I can speak to those experiences. If I'm actually a plumber, I can speak to those experiences. And the fact that I'm a black woman doesn't mean that I should start narrating how to unclog my drain. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, the, the, the flip side of getting rid of identity politics then is to acknowledge that everyone has an identity politics. And that's where I think you see a lot of people talking more about what white identity politics are and how the right has long wielded white identity politics as a weapon. And I think the, str the trick is now to get people to recognize um, more viscerally the reality that a white male perspective isn't this pristine enlightenment perspective. It is just an identity lens that is so normative that they can't see it, and therefore they're in fact more biased than anybody else when we're talking about issues relating to identity. So um, the materials, materialist philosopher, according to Louis Althusser, is someone who gets on a train without knowing where it's going. And that is what you are about to witness in my remarks now. <laughs> I have been asked to address the question of affect and the question, the concrete questions of organizing. Let me say first, to deal with the question of affect, to return to the point Wendell raised about what is likely to be the most controversial aspect of my book, which is the chapter on passing. And I will, I will trace it to a novel which is not discussed in the book by Nella Larson called Passing about two black women who grow up together and then lead diverging lives in which one decides to pass for white, marries a white man and enters white society, and the other decides to remain in black society. And they encounter each other, and the first invites the other over for a social gathering in which her white husband appears and begins to make extremely racist remarks not realizing that anyone in the room is black, because everybody is passing, even though one is doing it intentionally and the other is doing it unintentionally. And so the protagonist or the narrator uh, describes how the protagonist feels a kind of rage, just while her friend feels a kind of guilt, okay? and that also the protagonist enters into a double bind, which is this, that if she were to respond to the racist remarks of this white man by saying your very own wife is, is, is black, she would be betraying her friend. But by not doing so, she is betraying her race. And this is the double bind that she experiences. And then when she returns, home to her own husband to tell him about the experience. He says, you know, when, when people pass, they always come back. They always come back. And she says, why is that? And he says, if I knew that, I'd know what race is. Hmm. Extraordinary. But what I want to point out with this, 
is first of all, the slipperiness of these dynamics of identity and passing. We may find that our identity is something that we have not chosen, which is based on a misconception uh, by another, a misrecognition. And our identities just as much may be constituted by a misrecognition of our own lived experience. Our partial perception of our own lived experience which has causes that lie outside of what we immediately perceive. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what's called ideology. Um, on the question of organizing, how do you deal with these affects which combine rage and guilt, not necessarily in two separate people, but even in one person, and which play out in a way that completely changes the character of a movement? How do you deal with these affects? Well, I think that the solution, as with most solutions that I propose, is one that is involved in the documents of the Third International. And um, <laughs> it is the idea that uh, the responsibility of each militant is to criticize first their own national chauvinism, the chauvinism of their own nationality. Now, what we call races, was it, that's what they mean by nationalities. And people ridicule this idea like, oh, you say that black people are a nation in the US, that, that, that it's, it's confusing race and nation. Well, race is not such a self-evident category that we can just say uh, common sense, it's, 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 it's race and not nation. They called it oppressed nationalities. And the, and the argument was, and this goes back to the whole uh, discussion of Garveyism, that white Americans must take responsibility for criticizing white chauvinism, the chauvinism of their own nationality, and that in, in the account of Harry Haywood, he says, black comrades, and we can extend it to all comrades of color, must criticize the chauvinism of their own national conception, which uh, is complex now, not one nationality or not one race and so on. And that's the responsibility I felt in writing this book and that I think, uh, Brianna, you described a feeling of responsibility to make this argument. And I think it, that, that's a fundamental part of it. A final point related to this on the passions. I think that a, a, a fundamental explanation for why very individualistic and defeatist conceptions of identity politics are now so dominant, that is uh, uh, a reduction of um, anti-racism to the advancement of a particular individual uh, or to the uh, ascent of uh, a black president uh, during whose terms uh, an entire movement against racist police violence had to emerge because the problem persisted. This reduction has to do with, um, and now we, we may enter into a, a classic philosophical dispute, I think has to do with what Spinoza called sad passions. That is, the fact that we feel unable to act. These passions are driven by our feelings of powerlessness which result from the decline of mass movements and mass organizations which were able to intervene in political situations, and such we are subjected to sad passions. And so my proposal is, and I don't know whether this book achieves it, but my proposal is that we pass over into joy, which is the joy of acting, which comes with organization. Organization and drinking, maybe. Uh, I only raise that to, to, to segue out of this, but yeah. do you want to make some moral statement about that in response? Oh, okay. Uh, in, in which you, we can both organize and drink uh, right now. Either, both, whatever you want. Um, I wanted to just thank everyone for participating in the panel. I'm sure people are going to be um, talking more right after this. Um, over there, over here. Any final words that... Uh, People want to share before, before Lee? Enjoy the drinks. <laughs> and the organizing. Thank you so much again. Um, any, any blur, any websites or Twitter accounts you want to share? Anything? No, all right. Anyway, thank you guys so much. I have thank a you podcast. For so. Podcast. <laughs> um, everyone look out for all these people. Uh, SWAT, someone, someone's wrong on the internet. 
I know we non-academics, we got to hustle because we don't have like an Ivy League institution.